So I'm excited, as I said, I usually am pretty excited. If you've been here, then you know I, I do get, I tend to get pretty excited about these events, but we, you know, um, there is a, a term, creative co collisions. And that's kind of how we met, um, because uh, your co-founder, the CEO of the company, uh, Patrick uh, Baines, reached out to me on LinkedIn, and we're gonna talk about the power of social, social marketing. And um, he had been interviewed on Startup Grind in Philadelphia, yeah. where, you, where Nerdwise is based. Yeah. And um, I did like what I always do, which is when someone reaches out to me on LinkedIn, I never just accept. I always go in first and see who they are. Are there any, you know, what, does it make sense for us to, to connect? And of course I saw, oh my gosh, this is awesome. You know, and he said, I've got a, you know, got a, a co-founder in your area. So we just, it's been amazing, it's been awesome. You know, we got together uh, out uh, at your home office and realized there was really some, some synergies. And the more I learned about what NerdWise does, I realized that it was an important conversation um, for the folks that you're talking to already, the companies and the verticals that you're reaching. But I know for myself, I don't necessarily give social marketing the importance that I ought to, or give it the attention for my business businesses that I should. So first, I just want to say thank you um, for taking time out of your schedule to hang out with us tonight. And um, I always like to kind of start off from the beginning and say, you know, um, when you were growing up, were there folks that you saw around you that either were entrepreneurs or owned their own businesses? Did you kind of get that bug? I did. Looking back at it now, it's easier to see. Um, but none of us, again, have that crystal ball to be like, oh, I know exactly what it was sure. like. Sure. Uh, but I, absolutely. I mean, my mother, my father, uh, some friends and family along the way, they absolutely were serial entrepreneurs in their own rights. It might have not been in the uh, digital or social marketing space because sure. that probably actually didn't even exist. Sure. Uh, but I knew uh, and had great mentors uh, along the way. There's, mm -hmm. there's actually, if I had to pinpoint one person, it would be my mother and my father. Mm -hmm. Whether it was something as silly as like owning a coin-operated laundromat sure. or owning an apartment sure. complex or trying to flip homes, uh, that is being an entrepreneur in your own right. Entrepreneur is just, you try to take something and maybe make it your own, make it better, mm -hmm. set your sights on a certain goal mm -hmm. and try to achieve them. But what I noticed along that route was he never really did it alone. Mm -hmm. And that was a, probably a lesson that was one of my first, maybe. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, it's, it's interesting that you, that you say that because very often the entrepreneurial journey can be kind of lonely, it can be um, solitary. Mm -hmm. um, you need people, you need your vendors, you need your customers and all those sort of things. It really, it turns out to be about team. It, it's like it's entrepreneur, but it almost shouldn't. It almost seems like it shouldn't be that singular term because you really can't do it by yourself. So, can we talk a little bit about? Um, and, and we'll we'll kind of move from 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 the past and kind of move forward. I think we'll probably, you know, segue back and forth. But talk about what team means to you today. Team means to me today, uh, probably. It means a lot, to say the least. And I know yeah. that might not be the best yeah. way to like come no. off, but no. without a team, you, you can only go so far mm -hmm. by yourself or with right. one other person. But when you can enable others mm -hmm. on your team to strive for those same goals that you have mm -hmm. and collaborate on whatever it is your mission or, or your sites are set on, that's, that's important. You, mm -hmm. you can't do anything great by yourself. You can do a lot. You sure. absolutely can. Sure. You know, if you want to go in a straight line and, and move fast, go by mm -hmm. yourself. But you want to build something that turns into the right type of monster, sure. you need a team. Right. And that team has to be enabled to create that success that we're all looking to achieve because uh, you can only do so much, again, going sure. back to it by yourself. Sure. I mean, sure. Yeah. And, you know, even with NerdWise, um, it's, a, it's an interesting story because you and Patrick knew each other. Um, for a while and maybe talk about that. Talk about how, because it was, it was an interesting journey. You knew each other and, and then you kind of both did life and. Yeah, I mean, I had a completely different background. I was, I was in the dark when it came to digital and, or social mm -hmm. marketing or even just being an entrepreneur. Sure, again, I had great mentors and guidance sure. and I saw that along uh -huh. my life uh, from a, a kid to a teenager, but I was in sports medicine. Patrick was very much uh, business affiliated. Mm -hmm. He had his early days at LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. He started uh, People Links and Free Source and, uh, we did. We went our separate ways for maybe like 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. And we were really close friends. I mean, we were the same 
uh, year at Alfred University in mm -hmm. 2003. We were on the same level as far as like uh, when we were in the like dorms. We were both sure. on the third floor. Sure. And we were just really good buddies. Mm -hmm. I mean, he would come out and support all the, the sporting events because I was big into football right. and athletics and, right. and athletic training. And Patrick was always like, always like a big fan, a big cheerleader, and I was always a fan of everything that he was doing. Sure. But we never had this way to kind of cross-pollinate our worlds mm -hmm. until maybe five to six years ago. Right. And again, we both had our successes mm -hmm. separately, mm -hmm. but there was always this kind of gut feeling, maybe he had it, I know I definitely did, that there'd be a way that we could link up. At some it point. just had to be mm -hmm. the right time sure. and just, again, the right moment. But right. I knew if there was somebody that I was gonna dive deep into this world with, sure. uh, it didn't matter what it was, sure. it was gonna be somebody that I had a standing relationship with mm -hmm. and somebody I could really trust. Right. And he had been pitching me a, a couple different times to try right. to join his team. Mm -hmm. I just wasn't ready right. at, at those moments. Well, I think what you're saying is really important because what I'm hearing you say is a lot about seasons. And so you, you had one particular season where there was some affinity that you had some things when you were in school together. Mm -hmm. um, and then what you did, what you really kind of poured your passion into initially, different than what you're doing now. Talk about your, your sports medicine. Yeah, I mean, I loved it. I give a lot of credit for where I am today to the people and the mentors and the peers I had around me through sports medicine. I mm -hmm. graduated with a very small group at Alfred University. Right. There couldn't have been more than four people in my graduating class. I mean, that's max. Right. So one, you had to show up. Mm -hmm. Two, you better work hard. Right. And three, there was no cheating, stealing, or lying. There was nothing. <laughs> There's um, only four. <laughs> and, you, and it also built up this uh, natural will and grit because when the clock rang at four o'clock in the morning, mm -hmm. you knew you had to be there to support your team. Sure. And I was always somebody that, I never wanna let anybody down. Sometimes right. those things do happen, sure. nobody's Absolutely. perfect. Um, but that really kind of gave me a wholesome look as to like, what it meant to be accountable, what it meant mm -hmm. to have a good work ethic, mm -hmm. what it meant to work hard and uh, do the stuff that maybe some people don't wanna do because it's not seen as this, uh, I'm trying to think of a good word. It, it doesn't come it's with like a, like, like a stardom or like sure, glamorous. Sure, yeah, it's not, sure. you know, making ice bags and covering bandages right. or, 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 or lesions, whatever it is. That stuff's sometimes not glamorous to people. To me, it's where my passion started. Mm -hmm. I, I like that people could trust me. Mm -hmm. They would come to me for advice because they saw I was there for them. And that kind of spiraled into this world like, I want to be a voice that people can lean on mm -hmm. and can feel comfortable reaching out to me, whatever the case is. And mm -hmm. it didn't always have to be for sports medicine. Sometimes it would be for um, stock advice or financial sure. advice or sure. like, you know, talking about homes and insurance. And sure. these are a lot of things that, you know, my family passed down to me and I didn't really know it. Um, but I can honestly say looking back now, I had, a, I had just such a fortunate circumstance with my right. dad always maybe not telling me what to do, but showing me, and my mother too, I mean, right. showing me the way. Because right. they say, you know, it's sometimes actions speak louder than words, sure. that type of um, philosophy, and it, it really is true. I, I maybe took it for granted, but now I look back, mm -hmm. and I'm like, God, I was blessed with so much uh, good mentorship. Right. And uh, now I want to be that person for, sure. for many people. Sure. And whether it was sports medicine or it's in this current role, role as a co-founder at NerdWise, I love that people feel comfortable to reach out to me and know that I'm willing to go to battle. Right. I don't care what day, what time, sure. what the problem is. Everyone's got problems. Doesn't matter what's happening. Right. I'm ready to try to find ways to solve them right. and get over those hurdles. You know, the things that you know, I was kind of just taking some notes of some of those characteristics and traits and the things that you're talking about, um, it, it, they're universal. Yeah. Um, not, I mean, you, you were things that, like you say, you discovered them, your parents instilled a lot of those things and really demonstrated them to you. Um, and as you were in this kind of a small, still I see team throughout the whole thing, mm -hmm. um, this small group uh, at your college, and you know, the, the accountability, the work ethic, you know, uh, the trust and um, mentorship, those are all those things that now you are, and we're gonna talk about that, the things that you're doing as a leader at NerdWise. Mm -hmm. um, but there was, a, there was a kind of a journey that you went through. 
Um, you kind of, um, you had some, and, and this is really what Starter Grind is all about. It's absolutely, we know the success and we want to hear about that, but also some of the things that folks have overcome to yeah. reach that level of success. So yeah. talk about that. Yeah, I mean, as you know, we've had a couple conversations yeah. the past few months, and I dug some pretty deep trenches in mm -hmm. the world of sports medicine. I loved it. I give yeah. a lot of credit, again, to where I am today, to those moments in time for those 10 or so years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, unfortunately, was hit with a pretty hard curveball, which was an autoimmune disorder. Mm -hmm. And it was ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. Mm -hmm. And you want to talk about some uphill battles sure. and punching above your weight and climbing some mountains. Right. Uh, those were some really tough years mm -hmm. uh, to say, like, man, I got this passion and this drive to be a leader in this space. And then, you know, diseases don't care about your race, mm -hmm. your background, Absolutely. the money in your pocket. Sure. When it hits, it hits. Mm -hmm. So I had to take a step back um, because I could no longer be the best or be right. what I wanted to be and knew what I could be sure. in that space. And fortunately enough for me, uh, through many surgeries or therapies, whatever you want to call it, right. Uh, a lot of grit and determination and battles uh, led me to figure out like, I can create my own destiny. Sure. I, I, if there's one person I can count on, mm -hmm. it's me. Absolutely. And the beauty of that struggle led me to find someone like Patrick again and reconnect because I knew he could count on himself because right. he had gone through maybe not similar battles with you know his health in, in that regard, but he had gone through some trials and tribulations sure. of successes and failures of his own startups and, mm -hmm. and just life in general. Um, Nobody has this like rainbow glitter road to success Absolutely. and it's like, oh, this is great, everything's sure. fine. Um, but again, I had that curveball thrown at me and it was a tough pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. It's like, man, I, I still don't know if I can ever get back to that. But at the same time, I'm not really concerned about it because I take those lessons and those sure. moments and those experiences mm -hmm. and I still carry them with me today. Right. And I, I share them with people, whether they know it or not. Sure. And I use it to just drive the car yeah. that we're currently all in. Yeah. Whatever it yeah. might be. Right. And yeah. I love it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I absolutely love all the things I learned from sports managers because they absolutely do carry over sure. into what I do today. It's like hard work, mm -hmm. communication, absolutely. being accountable, showing up, it, it, like just being there for your team, no matter mm -hmm. what the circumstances. Sometimes they're really tough, sometimes they're really easy, and there's also everything in between. It's nice that when you when you know there's a shoulder or a hand that's going to be there to save you, sure. or just go through whatever sure. that battle Absolutely. is. Absolutely. Because uh, again, whether it's sports medicine or being an entrepreneur in a startup or, mm -hmm. or anything in life, it doesn't matter. It's really tough to go at it alone. Absolutely. It is. It's a lot Absolutely. more comforting when you can trust somebody mm -hmm. to go through those battles with you. Right. And win or lose, you're going to come out a better person. Absolutely. So you so we're we'll, we'll kind of fast forward to where. Um, you and Patrick re reunited mm -hmm. and decided that this was the time, this was the, this was the company. Yeah. And so it was just the two of you, you know, you, yeah. it's not where you are now, mm -hmm. um, but you started off just the two of you and we were talking earlier in a co-working space, yeah. um, just kind of building. So talk about how that was for you two to come, you've kind of both done your, done your things for, for about 10 years mm -hmm. when you came back together. So talk about the, the genesis of NerdWise. Yeah, so after about 10 years of being in sports medicine, I did try to branch out on my own to do some business, uh, we'll say like business strategy or, or just business development, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it on the mm -hmm. West Coast. And it worked well for about two years. And then I was coming back. Patrick's like, you know what? I've left people links. Uh, I've got this idea that we've been kind of talking about for the past couple of years. And at that time it was called Game Time Updates. Right. And I'm like, Patrick, like, I don't even know what this thing <laughs> is. Like, I'm, I'm foreign to the world of digital and social right. marketing. Like, I'm not a right. big fan of Facebook. Um, I know he loved LinkedIn, was like always gloating and, and boasting it up. And that stuff all seemed really fine and dandy. But I just was like, well, I don't, I don't really know. Sure. But if there was one time or one moment and one person that I was willing to take that chance on, mm -hmm. Uh, it was during that transition back from California. Mm -hmm. So I mean, again, I had potted myself around you know, the whole Northeast area and then I moved out West and when I was coming back East after about that two year stint, Patrick then brought back the idea of game time updates and he's like, I've got time, you've got time. <laughs> We've got a relationship that goes back about <laughs> right. 10, 15 years. Sure. We've never done anything together. Sure. Uh, you know, We've tried you know, in mm -hmm. the past, maybe when it was uh, people links, but why don't we give this a shot? Now's the time. And I was like, yeah, man, I'll, I'll trust yeah. in you uh, to be a great leader. You'll right. trust in me to be somebody who can learn and help develop and grow and, sure. and do all these things that it takes to, to create success. And 
I said high five. Let's do yeah. it. <laughs> so, let's, so, what, so let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about what what actually um, the, maybe the evolution of what game time update and mm -hmm. how it became nerdwise. What actually is the service that you guys are offering? So I thought that was important. At that time, it was trying to help bars and restaurants spread the news, just like you would on a, a radio or in mm -hmm. a newspaper, that maybe there were some upcoming games or there was a UFC event, and maybe they had some bar specials, you know, right. drinks or wings, whatever the case is. And Patrick had seen many, many years ago, he may have been in college still actually, so this is going back like 15 years or, or so, that in real time, the owners or the bar managers were telling people to come watch these games, mm -hmm. but it's like the game's already started. You've mm -hmm. got to create that ripple effect maybe before. a week before. Sure, sure. And what he realized, maybe like his light bulb moment, was that there's a way for one, humans to do this better, mm -hmm. or there's software that can maybe potentially automate this stuff. Right. So what can we do to make people successful but simplify the process at the same time? Right. And from there, we started going to every bar and restaurant and we started to listen to the loud roars of the feedback that we were getting. And it was, right. you know, it was good and bad, you know, just like anything else. Mm -hmm. But we took all of those lessons and we continue to this day to listen to those roaring feedbacks uh, or that roaring feedback and uh, put it into action because that's some of your most valuable sure. assets. Customer, yeah. Customer like just feedback. listen to what people are struggling with or where they have problems or where they're mad at you for not delivering and right. like make it better. Right. You know, and it doesn't have to be these massive pivots or overnight changes. Right. Uh, they can be small little iterations along the way. Right. And those iterations allowed us to develop great partnerships in verticals like health and fitness, mm -hmm. medical and dental, mm -hmm. and then professional services. Uh, I mean, these are all areas that needed assistance because sure. At the time, personally, we probably all had a Facebook page and mm -hmm. maybe at that time we had Instagram for fun, but businesses weren't leveraging the audiences that they had built up over right. time to create awareness about like what's happening inside their facility. Right. Like what is that inclusiveness? What is that synergy that is getting people excited? Right. Um, and here we are today. I mean, we've got probably 500 partners across the globe. We've right. got 10 plus full-time employees and, mm -hmm. you know, five to 10 part-time contractors, which uh, to me is pretty special when you think we were just two guys in an apartment sure. six years ago, you know, looking at a, a, a map on a wall, trying to go door to door, looking for like bar right. owners. Right. And um, it's been a fun journey. I'll say yeah. that. So a lot of things that you just said are, they, they speak to I think not just the startup journey, but any any company that's coming together, you know, it's finding the right the, the critical part, finding that right co-founder. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can't do it by yourself. It just you know it'll start off great, but any time that you want to scale, there has to be um, more than one. Mm -hmm. So so definitely finding that that right co-founder. You guys were able to do that, and then the other piece of it really hitting the pavement, like literally hitting yeah. hitting the pavement. In, in your case, it mm -hmm. was it was going from door to door, and it was finding mm -hmm. really. Um, it almost seems like that is the epitome of, of what a successful business does, which is you find your customer, find the right target customer, and then you find their problem, which they may not even be aware of what that is, but you open it up uh, for them in a way, but then you also bring that solution. Yeah. So all of those are steps that kind of go into a way of um, creating certainly a business for yourself, but it, it all comes down to, to creating value for that customer. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that was game time update, and you were doing that um, mostly in the restaurant um, and bar yeah. Uh, vertical. Yeah. Uh, and then you realized that um, w when did you change from from game time update to to, to Nerdwise? So there was a couple different uh, versions, brands, and versions. <laughs> and today, as we know, we're, we're Nerdwise, which is a is a great name, and we love it. Um, <laughs> But we started to realize that we were having difficulty finding the decision makers in bars mm, and restaurants. And, okay. you know, a lot of doors were being shut on us. So we're saying, okay. thinking to ourselves, well, if it's really hard to get into that space, where can we get in a little bit easier? Mm -hmm. And then that's when we figured out health and fitness. Okay. You know, a lot of health and fitness facilities, whether you're a, a Fit Body Boot Camp or an Orange Theory Fitness, you can mm -hmm. go down the list. It doesn't matter. It can even be a mom and pop. They go into these businesses knowing that they're great at being on the mats or being mm -hmm. the trainer, whatever right. the case may be. They might get excited about doing their social media and digital marketing. Uh, however, they do not want to eventually, they figure out they don't want to spend the time to do it. And there's a lot more 
to it than just like the the daily content you know mm -hmm. what's being published to your Facebook LinkedIn Instagram Twitter you name it and, you know all that stuff is fun for a little while right uh, but then you realize like man I should be out doing what I'm great at which is being on the mat sure. absolutely and right. we knew that they had a, a bigger problem which is finding new clients mm -hmm. so then we started hearing some pretty loud roars we're like not only do I want to stay top of mind with my members but I want to find ways to bring new blood into the facility right so how can we do that well right. there's a lot of things that started to develop there and what started to work in health and fitness like great raw authentic organic content you know mm -hmm. promoting your members of the month giving special shout outs for people who have great transformation stories uh, we knew that those things were important but we started to drive success through leads uh, or through uh, email marketing Okay. And then eventually it became, and this is like a couple of years ago, like chatbots. Okay. And then we figured, okay, then we should probably work on the paid advertising stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because everybody started to understand like, wow, like there's this really social, uh, powerful social network. And maybe if I just spend money on it, I'm going to make a ton of money in return. And that might have been the case like five to ten years ago. Mm -hmm. Where everybody could just like make it rain credit cards on Facebook just because they had an ad out there. Sure. But what we've found now over time is that that doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is have great organic content. You've got to have like an inclusive community. You have to have a good email engine that's constantly right. working. Uh, you've got to have other systems integrated like chatbots. Mm -hmm. And then sure, your paid advertising gets a little bit easier or more successful. Right. And what we realized that when we succeeded at that particular level in health and fitness, mm -hmm. we said, well, if it works well here, what are other industries sure. it can sure. work for? And that's when we branched out into health, or I'm sorry, medical and dental facilities. Okay. Uh, and that might not be the sexiest thing to go after. <laughs> However, they still have the same or very similar problems. Right. You know, they're looking to create some excitement or engagement on their local pages. They're looking to find ways to communicate with their members mm -hmm. or maybe future prospects without even being available. Sure. And they need to drive new prospects through that door right. on a regular basis. Can you talk a little bit about um, what, what I love about and why, why I wanted you to come and talk to us um, is because although these are the verticals that you've identified, what I love about it is um, so often things are, I buy something, but I have to figure it out. I've, I've you know, where, you know, I've, I've got to take that time. I've got to build those resources where if I, if I kind of knew how to do it already, then I'd be doing it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it sounds like you're, what, what NerdWise is able to do is, especially those verticals that you're very familiar with, you are able to um, find out, because uh, my, my first thought was like, well, okay, so you've got a Planet Fitness and you've got a, you know, Orange Theory, they're both fitness centers, how are they going to both, um, but, but your methodology and the way that you operate is that you are able to give different information that's Absolutely. relevant. So talk, talk a little bit about how that works, it almost seems like it could work for any, almost any company. Yeah, I mean, certain things are, um, I, I wouldn't, I hate to say the word cookie cutter, but certain things are very similar across similar. every mm -hmm. vertical, sure. but we always go through a, a setup process where we get to mm -hmm. know your business yep. and what your goals are, where you are currently, mm -hmm. what certain uh, assets you might already have access mm -hmm. to and mm -hmm. what we can leverage to help better your business maybe sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. So really, again, maybe we're always at the 50 yard line with any client that we go into a partnership with, mm -hmm. but the other 50% is like what makes them unique and how we can support them that makes them feel special and right. makes their members or whatever it is or their their uh, partnerships feel like they're unique and when we get that understanding through maybe a one to two hour setup mm -hmm. and just asking some really mm -hmm. easy questions it helps to differentiate you between your competition right um, there's enough toys in this sandbox for us all to sure. play and to have success here right. and if we can do right by many people then we're all just really happy mm -hmm. um, and that's that's a big goal of ours is that we know that we can help uh, basically almost anybody uh, and I, I think I may have mentioned this to you in the past like I'm curious to find out like who we can't help sure because I really right. don't know who yeah, it is yet right. um, and there's going to be certain things that work well for lawyers and mm -hmm. real estate agents versus maybe health and fitness or bars sure. and like there are right. some differentiators like no mm -hmm. question about it but it's going through those uh, experiences of trial and error and figuring out like well where do we steer the conversation right. once we get this feedback and we go through this setup plan? Right. Uh, and that's where, when you ask the right questions or enough questions, you really start to pinpoint mm -hmm. what is not only the business 
going to be excited about, but what's also going to help them be successful and sure. achieve the goals, whether they're short or long term. Right. Uh, so we really do take a lot of time. I would say not only in the first uh, setup call, which is maybe one to two hours, mm -hmm. we probably take the first 30 days to really become vested in, in your interests mm -hmm. and hit on those expectations that you're looking for us to deliver. Because it, as much as it is turnkey, there's a lot that goes into building these engines. Right. Uh, no matter what industry or segment that sure. you're in. It, sure. I mean, we're pretty turnkey, don't get me wrong. Uh, however, it still takes a lot of effort, uh, a lot of people on our team to create mm -hmm. and establish that success early and often. I guess we know that it's a, it's a product that works well for pretty much any kind of vertical. Yeah. It's definitely shown itself um, to be uh, applicable in fitness. Um, mm -hmm. So what would be, if you could kind of walk through the process of a company that, that differentiates you, I think that's where I was trying to go. That's going to differ, what, what NerdWise offers, that's different from another company that says, oh, we will help you with your social media. One, I believe we really pride ourselves on customer service mm -hmm. and just like transparent communication. Mm -hmm. We know that nobody's got this crystal ball to guarantee certain sure. areas of success sure. and be like, you give me a thousand dollars, I'm going to give you a hundred thousand dollars back. Sure. If they say that, like, be weary. Right. Um, <laughs> right, 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 absolutely right. And we also know that by getting to know our clients and establishing like who's responsible for what, like whether it's content or email marketing or driving their paid advertising, that those are the pillars that are going to establish the success for them mm -hmm. on the long haul. We know that many of our competitors, if it, you know, if we want to call them that, only really drive one pillar, which is paid advertising. Mm -hmm. Everyone, everyone wants to play in the sandbox of paid sure, advertising. Sure. Like that's great if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a pretty uh, shaky or sandy foundation. Because what you kind of need to, I'm thinking, you know, um, and this is not something that I, I, I'm interested in finding out more because I, for my own companies, I would like to, to be able to utilize it, but. Um, I think of Facebook advertising, mm -hmm. but don't you really kind of have to know, you can't just put anything up there as an ad, you're, you know, as, a, as an owner, mm -hmm. I'm creating the content. So is that, that's something that NerdWise, uh, you learn about the company and Absolutely. you begin to, and that's what gets the return. I yeah. mean, that, uh, that's what I think I, I want to kind of talk about how it begins to bring back to the company mm -hmm. um, based on what, you, what you're offering. Yeah, I mean, I want to get to know everything about you. That's why it will enable us to be the spirit or the voice behind those messages, mm -hmm. whatever they might be. Uh, and what we are finding is that by asking all of these questions, it allows us to know their brand standard, uh, what they're most interested in, where they're maybe having the most success. And also on the other side, why do we want to duplicate anything that maybe has failed for them in the past? Like, why do we sure. want to waste their time and money? Sure. And these types of candid questions allow us to create that confidence in the relationship because they start to trust us. Like, they like and know us because they see our case studies and everything that we've done across every segment, but they start yeah. to trust us because they know, like, we're on their team. And we mm -hmm. tell them, like, we are basically glue to you and we want to be that way. We don't want to sit behind a screen and hide and, and just never talk with you. Like we want to know what's happening because it's as if you're hiring your own internal marketing sure. provider, sure. you know, your own marketing employee, uh, but for a much lower cost, a, a fraction of that cost. Is it is there a, a size of a company that's a really good fit for you? Because I'm thinking in terms of maybe a smaller company that can't afford to have their own marketing team or a content creator or something like that, or it, it sounds as if it really you're an extension of another company. Yeah. So um, it works uh, whichever. It does. I mean, you have to have certain resources. Like, I can't come and take pictures for you. Sure. And I can't just, I mean, we can build certain things um, from scratch, but it takes right. a lot longer to mm -hmm. do. It does help if people have some of these assets already mm -hmm. available, mm -hmm. um, whether that's like maybe an email database or maybe hopefully at least a, a social media presence on LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. Like, those things help. Sure. However, we also know that some of our best successes and our biggest learnings came from our most difficult clients mm -hmm. who started with absolutely nothing. Right. And it's like, well, if you can make those two uh, specific experiences, successful, man, what can't you do? Sky's the limit. And, I mean, those, those early on were very challenging uh, clients, mm -hmm. but today it's like, man, I love them for that. Sure. Because they pushed us to find ways to be creative and come right. up with unique uh, solutions for them, whatever the case might be. And speaking of solutions, you recently came out with a new a uh, new, talk about that, the, yeah. new, the new piece of what you guys are up to. So again, you know, social media has been around, this is like not foreign to any of us for like 15 to 20 years. Right. You know, it started on Facebook with like college 
uh, emails and then sure. it came to like the world and just having a personal address mm -hmm. and then businesses started to figure out like well why can't I be on this and all that other good stuff um, so again throughout this journey we knew that initially Facebook advertising was pretty powerful but like that leverage started to decrease pretty mm -hmm. rapidly because the market became very competitive or mm -hmm. overly saturated. Right. Anybody with a business page or a, you know a LinkedIn profile could start spending money, get in front of a certain audience, mm -hmm. and like s send their message. Very advantageous five to ten years ago. Today, um, it's like hit or miss when okay. you do that. So we figured, well, again, if you build a business that's just based off paid advertising, it's going to be a, a, a shaky foundation. Sure. So like, how do you? And this is a conversation Patrick and I have consistently. Like, what are the ways you can de-risk the services that you're providing? Mm -hmm. And what can you do that maybe doesn't cost money that creates a massive amount of upside or opportunity? Sure. And what we figured out are these four pillars. And you know, the fourth one, which is the last, is paid advertising. Mm -hmm. And if you want to make paid advertising successful, you better be doing really well at the first three, which we know is having like really raw really local and very authentic and inclusive uh, content on mm -hmm. your daily on your daily feeds whatever it is if you're a salesperson you should be a leader and a voice in that space mm -hmm. if you're a real estate agent you should be sharing all the success stories from somebody who wanted to move to the city of Philadelphia or New York City and because of you they were able to uh, create that opportunity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. enjoy that experience you should be sharing these things on a very high level as often right. as possible um, so we know that that is the first pillar the second pillar is well, how are you driving your brand when people aren't maybe online on Instagram or LinkedIn mm -hmm. or Facebook? Well, the way that you can stay top of mind is just by having really good uh, content through email marketing and maybe okay. even SMS marketing. Mm -hmm. Okay, what type of value are you bringing outside of the four walls of your business? Right. Um, are you selling or are you sharing certain best practices for anyone in Sandler training? Mm -hmm. um, are you giving healthy recipes to your members who are at Orange Theory Fitness? Mm -hmm. uh, are you giving certain specials to people who come to your bar and restaurant often and mm -hmm. saying, hey, like, here's a loyalty program. Like, sure. we'd love for you to come back. How are you staying top of mind and how are you bringing that value? How are you doing the extra sure. to get the return that you're looking for? Mm -hmm. And that's an engine that when done well, consistently, drives crazy returns. Right. But it takes one, a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Initially. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of creativity. Right. And you need the gas in the engine to run the car. Okay. <laughs> you need it all. Sure. And then going on to the third pillar, we know from the past, say, two years specifically, and again, it's been around for a lot longer, mainly on websites, mm -hmm. but the power of chatbots and just having a net on your front yard of your social pages mm -hmm. uh, and your websites included, like, that's powerful. Right. To know that when you go to a website or any uh, social media outlet, that there's going to be somebody there to answer your questions, even if it's not a real person. Sure. You know, it's not overly complicated, but it feels good when you know, like, someone's there to help you. To, right. To create that bridge between you and a business, whatever the case may be. Sure. And we know that by doing those three really well, it makes your paid advertising much more successful. Okay. Because when I see something, or you're in a foreign area, you typically look back at the organic stuff, which is reviews, testimonials, the inclusion sure. of your community, mm -hmm. what are people saying about you? Because mm -hmm. Patrice, you and I might know each other right now, mm -hmm. but maybe three months ago, I could have came to you and said, Patrice, I'm the coolest guy in this room. Mm -hmm. And you might be like, well, this guy's a little bit weird. Right. However, if we showed up to a party together and sure. somebody said to you, Patrice, did you just show up with Koo? Right. You might want to hang out with him. Like that's a, that's a pretty good right. that's a pretty good person to be around. Third You're going to buy it a hundred sure. times more, sure. and that's what's going to make all the pillars work together in like one ecosystem. Paid advertising is going to work well when you have consistency from the beginning to the middle to the end. Sure. And people don't want wishy washy. Right. They want consistency. They want a they want a straight shooter and they want simplicity. Mm -hmm. In this world of like complexity and chaos. They just want to be told what's like really happening or maybe shown. Right. And the best way you can do that is give social media high fives. Sure. Whether it's on LinkedIn because you hit a certain sales quota mm -hmm. or you just had your biggest real estate close or uh, in health and fitness because, you know, somebody lost 100 pounds or right. whatever the case may be. Again, sure. Um, those things really matter mm -hmm. because it's no more, uh, there's no longer this platform where it can be like vanilla or boring or generic. Right. right. People want to be. If social media is going to be a community, make it a real community. Mm -hmm. Don't make it this uh, 
inch deep and a mile wide type thing, mm -hmm. make it a mile deep and an inch wide, where it's like people really get to know these businesses mm -hmm. and their members and their communities. Right. And that's important to people. That's right. what gives them confidence to want to buy in and, and, and join that party too. Right. Mm -hmm. So we talked about some of the, uh, the, the types of industries mm -hmm. that this is a really good fit for, but I also know that you um, do uh, training for like sales teams. Yeah. So that was something that is not, you know, sales, Everybody needs sales. I mean, a company's not going to survive without sales, but talk about how that, that kind of deployment would work with a sales team. So, you know, everyone's looking for best practices, ways to improve their conversion, their retention, sure. lifetime value. Mm -hmm. You know, these equations are, are pretty well known. And what's important in those conversations, whether it's with a sales team or it's with a medical and dental practice or it's in the health and fitness space, is knowing like what it takes to create the success you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So if you're going after a sales team specifically or a sales individual, well, like what have you done to create success? And what does that success equation look like? Mm -hmm. And if you don't know, well, let's figure it out. Sure. Let's start somewhere and start making iterations along the way to mm -hmm. polish and fine tune it you got to start somewhere mm -hmm. um, and it could be like well how do you find new leads how do you prospect them how do you stay engaged mm -hmm. um, what are the best practices do you just call them once or email them once and you're like man I'm done with this sure it, sure it is absolutely a science to that art and there is a uh, it's a numbers game you, right. you can't give up and be discouraged because you know you got 20 leads and man, you know, only two converted. You should be super excited that one, two converted, how to keep them forever and figure out like, well, how do, they, how do you next time get three or four? Right. You know, right. what are the ways that you're approaching them? Um, and I would say if, if there's one thing that people get, it's, it's that they're discouraged because they don't get the results they want on the first attempt. Mm -hmm. And it's not about uh, the first attempt. Right. It's one like, are you, willing, are you willing to get back up and s go another round and swing? Sure. And if you fail the second time, are you going to do it a, a third and fourth? Sure. But you've got to have the right soundboard or the right strategy to keep approaching it in a certain manner. Mm -hmm. And we help our, our, our partners with all of that. I mean, right. so many of them work off referrals and, and sales, which is a mm -hmm. big, big win. Like that, I'm never gonna say cut out that bread and butter because that's a, that's a huge op opportunity. Um, but what else can you do to create that success? Mm -hmm. And if I can be that voice of confidence, like again, going back to sports medicine, you just gotta sometimes be there to have like a, a shoulder to lean on. Sure. Because it's tough to go through. And if you get inside your own mind, you become in this like situation where you're like in a vacuum. You're like, well, how do I get out of it? And then sure. you get a state of paralysis analysis mm -hmm. and all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but if you can just verbalize it to the world and just throw it out to the universe, there's a good chance that you can come up with a, a formula to achieve that success. And it doesn't start perfect, but the goal isn't to start perfect. Sure. The goal is to create success and keep getting better. Sustainable success. And if success. I can have small little wins along the way, right. looking back five years from now, they're monumental. Sure. I mean, I've seen it with us at Nerdwise. Mm -hmm. I mean, small wins brought us to where we are today, and right. you got to be willing to go through that journey because sure. it does not happen overnight. So let's talk about the company itself a little bit. Um, you are you're here in New York. Patrick mm -hmm. is in Philadelphia. Yeah. And your team now you've got about 15 or so team yeah. members. Yeah. So how how does how does that work? Your yeah. Well, we knew Patrick and I going back say six or so years ago that we didn't want to be glued to a desk nine sure. to five every day. Mm -hmm. um, at least we wanted to have the option to choose like where we wanted to be when that was happening. So we wanted to build this culture and bake it into our DNA that we could find success wherever we were. And mm -hmm. we knew that if we were going to be building the service based industry that was off of technology, right. then we should be able to do it anywhere. Because mm -hmm. if I have access to Wi-Fi, a computer, and hopefully a phone at the very least, right. you should be able to create success, especially if you've got something that's powerful enough to create the, you know, create and deliver the results they're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we really try to champion not going to a office all the time. We're like, well, why can't we do this in this state or in this apartment or this house or sure. whatever it is? And we wanted to build that in because we knew that there was going to be the shift in a trend in the workforce that not everybody wants to be in a city. Sure. Not everybody wants to only work from nine to five. I enjoy that I can work any time of day on any night or, or morning or weekends. Mm -hmm. That to me is a privilege. And we found people that felt just like us too. <laughs> and that was pretty exciting because then it's almost like you, be, you had like this believers club that wanted to be a part of the solution 
and breaking away from the status quo or the mold that is so, uh, so common. And we just kept finding awesome people all over yeah. the world. I mean, there's a lot of open source platforms from right. uh, Mechanical Turk, which is through AWS, or uh, systems like, I think it used to be called Odesk, and now it's called Upwork. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talented people out there. Right. And why do I want to eliminate anybody from this pool that's already really small. If I'm in a city and saying, hey, like you only can be in New York City and you have to be in New York City, man, there's a lot of talented folks out there across not only the United States, but the whole world sure. that want to do what we're doing. So why should I eliminate those opportunities? Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you have uh, you know, the deepest experience in social or digital marketing. Mm -hmm. I just want you to have the right intangibles, which is like a right. good work ethic. Right. You have the ability to be creative, a problem yeah. solver, somebody who communicates well with you uh, and others, and somebody who wants to be a part of something that's maybe a little bit different than the norm. Right. And be happy and be proud about that. Like right. wear that merit badge and wear it proudly because um, we have the saying where no one cares like how the sausage is made, which is like the product or the service. They just want it when it shows up to their door <laughs> to be delicious. I mean, I, I mean, there's right. plenty of times where I'm working at three in the morning, sure. but it's because maybe I, I couldn't sleep for whatever reason. I just, you know, I woke up and it's like, well, if I can't go back to sleep, I can still plug into work and maybe start my day or get ahead of something. Sure. And to me, that was a big advantage. And right. I don't think it was just for me. I think it, I, I truly feel it's for everybody on our team. Right. They love the freedom that, they can go and create their own schedules. They can yeah. block their own time. And what that allows them to do is eliminate some of the social pressures of the everyday commuter, mm -hmm. which is like, I've got to have my outfit ready. I've got to shower at a certain time. I have to have my <laughs> lunch prepared. And those things, if I can eliminate that from the equation, I know I can have them focus more on what they're doing what for they their need job. To do. Sure, sure. And that to me is like, worth its weight in gold. So let's talk about the transition for you from going, you and, and Patrick, uh, working together, mm -hmm. uh, kind of peer to peer. Now you've got this remote team, um, and so that's pulling on your leadership in a different kind of way. So yeah. how, how has that been? I mean, in terms of hiring, definitely you're talking about relational, you know, that that's really key. You're more almost more concerned with how an inv individual fits in the team as opposed to the things that can be taught. Mm -hmm. But as a leader, was there, was there, when it comes to the hiring, that process that you guys go through, whatever that process is, how did you, how did you come to that? And were there, were there mistakes made? Were there oh, absolutely. There's always mistakes. You just gotta learn from them. Um, for us, we had uh, some really early lessons where maybe we were really hopeful mm -hmm. in thinking that we found the right person or the mm -hmm. right people, and maybe we just were a little bit too ambitious. Mm -hmm. And what we found out through, you know, trial and error and just, you know, natural progression is if you want to just, if, if you want to um, see if somebody's worth bringing on full time, mm -hmm. like date them for a little while, just like you do in life <laughs> before you marry. And, you know, test them a little bit because let them step outside their comfort zone. Right. And those were some big lessons because sometimes, again, we've had people come on that unfortunately maybe it didn't pan out, but it That's wasn't right. the people's fault. It was, Pat, I point the finger at Patrick and myself because maybe we were a little bit too ambitious mm -hmm. or maybe we didn't have the right enablement material to champion the success that we were looking for. Right. So, I mean, those lessons were felt in a big way um, right. early on because it's like, you just get over ambitious. You're like, man, I just, I know if we can find this one next person, like it's gonna be great. Sure. And you, 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 all, you always want to have that wishful thinking, uh, but at the same time, you've got to, go through the due process and mm -hmm. really figure out if it's a good match. Right. Um, and that takes time, that takes sure. experience. Sure. And now I, I can tell you that anybody that comes on, they, they come on part time for a, a period mm -hmm. of time, whatever mm -hmm. that might be. It could be six months, it could be two months, um, but I'm not gonna jump in head first until we both get to feel right. each other out a little bit. Test drive a little bit. Yeah. Talk about, um, you know, it's a different thing obviously from being a like an employee of a company uh, to be in pretty much a business owner. Um, what are what is something that you love about it? Something that surprised you about? Like you did you're like, huh? I didn't expect that. So Good I, or bad? Yeah, I mean, I love the options this business gives everybody mm -hmm. because you get to. If you have kids, 
you get to maybe spend more time with your family or right. be there to drop them off at school or pick them up you know, from practice. Uh, that's probably the biggest thing that I absolutely enjoy. What I, I guess maybe a little surprised is how big of a pain in the butt Patrick would be sometimes. <laughs> I mean, you want to hear somebody beat a horse to death. Uh, Patrick will whisper loudly until something gets put into action. And it's all for the right intentions. I thought by being like good friends and close compadres right. that maybe sometimes it'd be a little bit smoother or easier. Um, but looking back at it, those are the things that made us who we are today. I mean, I didn't expect, you know, I would, I'll just say that, you know. Right. It was just, it'd be like, man, you just, you were not going to shut up about this one or two problems. Like, you're going to, you're really, even if I don't want it, like, you're going to keep putting right. it into action until it actually does. And more times than not, it, it's the right thing. It right. really is. Yeah. So, so it sounds like uh, having a co-founder that is also a friend. I mean, you want to, you definitely want to have that relationship. You don't want a, a stranger to be your co-founder, but having your, having a friendship yeah. uh, can, can cause some, some tension. Yeah. when it comes to make decisions. But I, I can honestly say that from a very, from very early on, there was just like a mutual respect between Patrick and I. Mm -hmm. There really was. Um, I trusted him, he trusted me. I knew that he had much more experience and I had probably maybe, a, I wouldn't say a better, but an equal work ethic and a will to like want to create opportunities and, and succeed just like anybody else. So it was something that maybe people told us not to do, mm -hmm. but, there was a, mm -hmm. but there was such a level of respect and understanding and transparency between us sure. that before we really set off on this journey that I don't, you know, I don't know if it, yeah. when and if it will ever end. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not thinking about that now, but uh, that, there was just a, a respect that I knew that we had for each other. Mm -hmm. And we both wanted similar things. We like we would sit down and we would talk about what are the top three or four things that we wanted to achieve. And I'll tell you this: money was never the top two or three. Right. It wasn't. Right. It was the very last one. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted to provide a environment that provided options and flexibility and resources to pioneer your own success, whether that's right. freedom or money or whatever that got you excited uh, and incentivizes you to to go out there and give it your best and be your best. And those, those conversations were really some of the heart and soul of what NerdWise DNA is today. Because it's, people want flexibility. Sure. People want options. Absolutely. And More so now. Yeah. That's what we do. I mean, I, I would yeah. say if we've got 10 full-time employees, maybe a little bit more, mm -hmm. I've maybe in the flesh only met maybe three to four. Mm -hmm. But I feel like they're best friends or they're right. family, even, even closer. Um, because we communicate, yeah. you know, and that's going back to like what maybe is one of the biggest pillars of our success with our many partners across all verticals is our willingness to talk to people. Right. Like, let's have a soundboard conversation. Let's just get to the table and see like what's going on. Sure. Let's figure out like where you're having problems, where you're having successes and everything right. in between. And don't shut the door even before we get a chance to talk. Right. And that's, pre that's a pretty powerful tool. So it sounds like culture is, is you know, especially with a remote team, mm -hmm. uh, building that culture, creating that culture yeah. would, would be vital. And how, yeah. how did that, I mean, was that, was the culture building something that just evolved through trial and error? Or did you guys kind of, when you two were together saying, okay, this is, this is kind of what we would like to see? I believe uh, that it naturally evolved mm -hmm. because of the way Patrick and mm -hmm. I are made up. Again, we're both completely separate people, sure. um, but we both had very similar beliefs and, and wants and, and wishes in life. Mm -hmm. So that type of stuff that we were both looking for, which for me, it was sometimes to be away from the city so I could be closer to my family and mm -hmm. my friends. Mm -hmm. And to Patrick, sometimes he was like, I'm done with winter. Like I need to be right, away from right. this as often as possible. Absolutely like, please right. shut that door. Absolutely and right. we would go out there to these open source platforms like uh, Upwork and, mm -hmm. and Mechanical Turk and try to find people who had similar mentalities as us and then bring them on, try to understand what their goals are and maybe where they have experiences or where they lacked or again, going back to it, it was like, do they have the right intangibles? Do they mm -hmm. want similar stuff? And really, I, I think many people want what we are providing yeah. as far as like a business and, and mm -hmm. a opportunity. Um, yeah. I hope that answers your yeah, question. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Have you ever encountered, and it's been about five years now, mm -hmm. uh, tough times, you know, lean times, I'm sure in the beginning as oh, you were yeah. building, has there ever been a time where you've just been like, you know what, 
had it, just done deal. We just wanted to throw the towel in. I mean, there were, I would say it would happen within the first two years, and it wasn't that anything that Patrick and I or anybody on the team at that time was doing wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, if there was one thing that I would maybe hinge it on, it was my condition. Because mm -hmm. during those first two to three years, right. uh, I unfortunately was in and out of hospitals mm -hmm. on too far of a regular basis, right. having way too many surgeries, sure. way too many therapies. Sure. If there was a time the Titanic was going down, <laughs> it was in the first two years. Right. However, I know that because Patrick kept it together and yeah. I still, I would, I never surrendered. I will look anybody in the face and say like, I didn't care if I was in a hospital or I was still sick at home. I was at work every single day. Like there's no excuses. Everyone's got, yeah, yeah. you know, everyone's, everyone's got, got something. something going on. Absolutely. So like, I would never want to point the finger back at myself and be like, I didn't give it my all. If I knew I had any ounce of energy or calorie in my body that could create some even minuscule like success, I was going to give it my all. Mm -hmm. And when we made it through that inferno, sure. uh, I knew there was no going back. Yeah. If we if we can handle 200 clients with three people mm -hmm. and one of them is basically dead, uh, what can't we do? Sure. In, Absolutely in all, in being right. completely honest. Yeah, sure. Um, and that to me just showed how strong mentally mm -hmm. we were we were as a team. That there was this never surrender mentality, no matter what the situation. And you gotta. Not everybody has that grit, um, but it's pretty important if you want to go through, you know, yeah. the trenches of getting to where I guess currently we are today, which in all honesty, I feel like we're just getting started. Right. It sounds like it it's with, wild. with the changes that you're, yeah. that you're, uh, that are, that are being made. Um, talk about, um, you know, mentorship is something that you've talked about a lot. And, you know, there was a time when you were seeking mentors mm -hmm. and now you are in that position of really being uh, you know, someone that is a mentor, um, I'm sure not just to your team, um, but just in general. So talk about that piece. Yeah. Um, well, in this particular, you know, five to six year time frame, I always wanted to get, you know, to a certain level where I could be respected and, you know, be a voice of reason in a community, whether it's in Albany or mm -hmm. New York or, mm -hmm. or like New York City or, or Philadelphia, didn't care, I wanted to get to that. But I knew what was really important is that you have to listen before you talk. Mm. So I would just go into any meeting that Patrick would kind of be going into, mm -hmm. and I would just sit there and watch, listen, observe, write notes, and figure out like, well, if this person's doing this really successfully, then like, why can't I? Sure. And if I have questions about it, I might not ask that individual because maybe mm -hmm. I was embarrassed or too shy. Right. But I can ask Patrick, who is fearless, mm -hmm. and be like, well, Patrick, like, can you explain this maybe a little bit better to me? Like, right. These people in Philadelphia, I mean, there were some, whether you want to call them like titans or giants, mm -hmm. I listened and learned from everybody. I mean, whether it was uh, Rick Genzer or Kevin O'Neill, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Peter Strid, David Lipson, these are all people who achieved some pretty high levels of success and all I knew I needed to do was one, attach myself to Patrick and two, just listen to all of their successes and failures. Sure. And the, pri the problems that they're going through as well, because you know, right. there's always problems every day. You just got to figure out, like, do you want to get up and do you want to solve them? <laughs> um, and these people enabled me to be like, wow, like, I want to be like these guys sure. or these girls or, or this mm -hmm. club. And it really kind of stemmed out of the co-working space mm -hmm. that we were in, which was Benjamin's desk at right. the time. Right, which I've heard and a lot about. They gave us a platform that uh, I'm forever thankful and grateful for. I mean, the whole Mayer family gave us. Uh, the opportunity to be seen and also to learn from everybody that was way better than us, mm -hmm. way smarter. Like, it's awesome to just listen to these brilliant minds and these geniuses be like, man, God, you are brilliant. I, I can't wait to like have enough money to, so we can hire you guys. You sure, know? sure. They were just so uh, bright in their own ways and their own roles and responsibilities. And uh, they had also gone through a lot of uh, you know, failures sure. as well. And it's yeah. like, man, these guys have gone through it and like, they're not mad, they just love the journey. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's yeah. what I learned as well too. It's like, man, they're not, they don't care about necessarily like this uber success. They just care about like going journey, through this journey yeah. right. because that's where the dream is. You know, it's not making a million dollars. It's like, I got a million dollars, that's great. It's like, no, like, who did you learn from? Who did you mm -hmm. uh, help? Who did you uh, mentor? And like, just all of these other different aspects. Right. And. It was, it, uh, it was a 
culture of inspiration in that whole area mm -hmm. of Philadelphia. I mean, if you guys have never been to Philadelphia, like, please go. It yeah. is the epicenter of awesome. Okay. It really is. Uh, right. There's such a good synergy of startups and entrepreneurs and co-working space that those people absolutely let us stand on their shoulders yeah. and learn from them. Okay. There's no question. So I wanted to leave some time for folks to ask questions. Sure. So I'll say thank you first. I'm going to thank you again. Um, but who might have a question for Coop? Are you asking if we, in, was I thinking about my family? When how, we do you, how do you navigate? Just, how do you navigate your, your family dynamics? And are, are you married? Yes, I am. Yep. Yeah. Well, I got a great wife, number one, who's understanding uh, and has been patient as like anybody I know out there because there was, a, there was many loud whispers, we'll say, as to like what we were going through, whatever the case may be. But it was really about setting the stage of expectations and knowing that like, if we want these certain things later on in life, flexibility to spend time with friends and family, then I'm gonna take this time to invest in as much as possible. Like, if I need to wake up at six o'clock on Saturday morning, or if I'm up at three o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday, like, I'm just going to work because I want a better future for us. And I'm doing all of these things because what matters to me most is, is not money. It, it's really about spending time with my family and time with my friends. And there's one thing that money can't buy for any of us, it's time. And I want more than anything to see my parents often, my friends often, my wife as often as possible in the future, kids. I want to be able to have the opportunity to be at the games and to you know, show up to school or, or whatever the case may be. That's setting the stage of like all this like hard work is going towards that. Like me pulling out my hair and ripping my eyes out sometimes, like it's all going towards a much brighter future. And it's sometimes not easy to see when you're not in the trenches with us. But here we are five years later, it's like, man, like now I understand what you guys were really trying to develop. And I know and understand why you sometimes would get up and start working on the off hours or the strange hours. It's because this is what you wanted. And when somebody sees those goals come into fruition and they also, uh, not to say like, uh, experience the rewards, but they appreciate and value. Um, that was really important. I mean, just for me uh, and my wife specifically, we were working in New York City and I was working out of our apartment and she was working full time at her role. And for us to move out of there, only one of us had to find a new like position. And yeah. it's a lot harder when two people have right. to uproot right. themselves. So if I can be that bridge for my family that makes it easier to walk over to the next opportunity, I'll be happy to work 70 hours a week to create that opportunity. And to me, that's more important than anything. I want to make it easy for us in time and everybody too. Like anyone that's on the team, like I want to de-risk the things that are happening inside of our services. And I want to make it a fluid and efficient process so that they don't have to always reinvent the wheel. Nobody should. Um, and when we can do that and we do that well, everybody can hopefully enjoy whatever they want. You know, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So was there ever like an aha or a light bulb moment that knew that we maybe had some traction and maybe should kind of go in a certain direction? Uh, there absolutely was. So when we started to go into our second vertical, which was health and fitness, we got some pretty loud feedback about, in this particular case, Facebook and boosting their posts. And we're like, well, what is this like whole boosting thing? And it's a way to get inside a geofence targeted area and get more exposure, just like you would through radio or billboards or, or you know, just whatever. And that right there, when we figured that was a way to maybe not only branch outside the four walls of your social media page, well, then how do we start to measure that? And because people would be like, well, did I get enough money for my $20 that I boosted this post for? I'm like, well, I don't know, <laughs> you know? Like, let's start to put some numbers in it and make it concrete. <laughs> and that right there was kind of like, well, not only is content and content automation really important, but it's also in the world of social media at that time, lead generation is gonna be a big factor because now people are gonna start thinking once they caught up to us, start figuring out if I'm spending $100, what am I getting back in return? Am I getting a certain amount of leads? What is that cost per lead? What is my conversion there? What's the retention? What's the lifetime value? All of these things started to become a uh, scientific formula. And that when many people wanted to start asking us to do boost, we're like, okay, well now we've got to put this thing into a box and find a way to actually own the data and measure the results that we're achieving. And from there, uh, 
it all evolved because then Facebook started to give you the tools and resources like business manager and ads manager to go and create success on their platforms. And like LinkedIn has LinkedIn Messenger. I mean, there's a whole you know, social selling solution on all these platforms. Uh, so these businesses, mainly you know, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, they evolved in a way that they knew businesses wanted to take advantage of the opportunity. So they, gave you, they built the tools to achieve that success. Now you just gotta know how to work the tools. Yeah. But it was, it was absolutely like four years ago when we were in health and fitness and people started asking us about boosting. And we're like, okay, well, here we go. <laughs> That's, yeah, good question. So you know, your question is, how did we approach our first industry or our first vertical? And it was because, uh, this is going back to maybe college days, we would be at you know, a bar and we would see the owners in real time trying to tell their fans on social media, like, hey, we've got this game happening and these specials. But it was a little bit too late. So we started to think to ourselves, well, how can we create that ripple effect maybe a few hours at the very least, but maybe a, a week or two in advance? So we actually probably started maybe with the worst client or the worst vertical because it was always really hard to find the decision maker. But uh, to, to answer your question, like we went where one, we had some experience in like bars and restaurants, and two, we just had the will to just never give up. We're, we're gonna keep knocking and knocking, then we're figuring, well, if we keep knocking, what's a better way to scale that? Well, maybe we just call and dial for dollars. Well, then maybe we should do email you know, marketing and it, it started to evolve, but it all came down to like where we thought we had an advantage, which maybe we really didn't. And then two, it was just the sure determination to not give up and be like, you do want this, you just don't know it. <laughs> you know, like <laughs> we are selling the best things since sliced bread, you're just not aware of it yet. However, that was six years ago. Today, it's a much different conversation. People know they need to leverage these social profiles and these social platforms to help better themselves and their business, whether they're a part of a mom and pop or they're a part of a enterprise and franchise, you now know how important LinkedIn is to have a professional uh, resume available. You know, who's endorsing you? Uh, what successes do you have? And again, it goes across every vertical on, on almost any platform. Um, but initially it was all about just like, I'm going to show you why you need this. And um, I hope that answers your question. Were there any tools or were there any programmers on our team that helped enable the success for our many partners? Um, the short answer is no, there were zero programmers. I have a background in sports medicine, Patrick has a background in business, and then our first intern was our inside sales guy. And he was kind of good at dialing on the phone. Um, but what we had is great leadership and great vision because Patrick kind of already saw what was unfolding and how the world was going to evolve. and. We do use different tools out there, different softwares. I mean, there's a million out there. They all essentially do something very similar. They're just branded a little bit differently. Like there are engines out there. Well, I mean, in the world of LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram, those platforms give you the tools. They give you the software to create success. Like those are there. Um, when it comes to email marketing, I mean, you can have your own simple Gmail, Yahoo, and you just have to have a certain prospect list that you're going after. Um, so the tools are out there. You don't need to have a programmer on your team. One, because it's, I just don't think it's necessary, and two, it's really expensive. And uh, you know, just through grit, determination, and being a little bit crafty or creative with the ways that you approach these problems matters just as much as being like a software engineer or anything like that. There's plenty of services out there and tools and uh, stuff that can make you successful. I mean, you don't have to be a programmer. So does that answer your question? Cool. Are we using, or are we developing our own algorithm and software, or are we utilizing other different you know, SaaS, SaaSes out there? And the answer is a, a mixture of both. Um, I'm not gonna give you the secret to Coca-Cola, um, <laughs> because that wouldn't be very right of me, um, but we do leverage certain things that are out there, uh, and we have created our own systems internally, um, but we do not have you know, a, a program developer or, or an engineer on staff. So, your question is, with the world of now, TikTok and YouTube and like video endorsements and all this good stuff, should people be utilizing it more? It's a great question, and I do believe that there's industry uh, specifics for that. Like for instance, I wouldn't tell uh, somebody who is like in a bar and restaurant to have a great profile on LinkedIn. Like it just doesn't match up. Uh, so there is a rhyme to a reason and a science to the art behind that formula. However, I will say we have to view social media and all these uh, 
video content pieces out there as if we're turning into a television station 50 years ago. Uh, what's going to keep people on the platform is video, is really engaging content. And the longer they stay on that platform, then the more successful the business is, whether it's YouTube or TikTok. What I like about them across the board is it forces us to be creative in different ways. And I believe each one has an opportunity on them, but you've got to pinpoint like where is the most advantageous point for you. Um, is it always for business or pleasure? Like YouTube is great for business um, if you can do it the right way. I mean, there's a certain approach you've got to have pretty polished videos to be on YouTube. You can't just like hold up your phone and be like, yeah, I'm on YouTube. Like you can do that and have your own channel, but like, is that really going to attract an audience? Like you've got to be pretty buttoned up in that world. Um, when it comes to TikTok, I think that's still relatively new. So I won't speak at length or in depth about it because I don't know enough about it. Um, what I like about it though is that it's forcing people or it's enabling people to just to one, reach a different community and just be creative and having fun. And that stuff to me is something we shouldn't overlook um, because it's so easy to lose that creative gene. And if you can just trigger that in any way, shape or form, I'm all for it. I don't care if you're on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, if you're using it for the right reasons to connect with people and invest in a community and create it so it's inclusive, like have fun with it, like be awesome, be as creative as you want to. There's no doubt that, I mean, YouTube, when you first had it, it was just to maybe listen to videos or to watch videos for like music. And Facebook was just for college, uh, college students. And you know, Twitter was for people who were angry. Um, <laughs> but, but like all these things, um, you know, they evolved for a reason because people saw the power that they could really harness. And to me, that's a synergy that I'm excited to be a part of. So the way that the question is, how do we build trust with our partners early on? And you know, what are maybe some of the systems that we use to develop that trust? And probably the first thing that we did really well is we documented everything. Google was our best friend. Google Sheets, Google Docs, you name it. That was our first CRM. That was the first way we created our systems and developed on those processes along the ways. We documented everything. The second thing that we probably did is that when we evolved those systems, we were able to put it into a certain presentation or into a box that they started to notice like, this is pretty polished, this is really well thought out, and this didn't just happen overnight. They, when you can show people what the outcome will be and guide them through that process, they're like, wow, like, this really has some layers to it and some steps to this uh, onboarding or this setup between you and I. They didn't just say, hey, like, this is turnkey, you just give us money and like, we're gonna just tell you to set it and forget it. There was a lot of question asking, there was a lot of documentation, and when we went through the whole setup process, uh, there was a lot of like, becoming familiar with the business owners because 80% of it is gonna be about the business conversation, but the other 20% is like, do you wanna work with these people? Like, do you enjoy collaborating and, you know, getting the medicine sometimes that you don't want to receive and are you transparent and candid about that uh, whatever that conversation is supposed to be at, be about so i believe people really trusted us because we didn't sell them lies we didn't give them false guarantees and say hey remember that stuff that you know we were doing last month yeah forget about it it doesn't work <laughs> this month we got the next thing um, we were very transparent in saying that Nobody in this room or in this world can see the future, but we're going to give you the best practices and take what we've learned and developed with our first maybe 10, 20, or 30 clients, and now it's evolved into this really unique process that is a beautiful system and showing you like this is the way to getting to where you want to be. And um, documenting everything from the very get go, from sales scripts to the way we onboarded to the questions we asked, having that information to then reference back and look at helped us to improve our day-to-day -day and our future processes. If we just kept guessing and pulling these things out of the ether or out of the universe, man, it's just like a crap show. It's the wild, wild west. But the fact that we took all of those wisdom nuggets and put them into paper or to digital papers or digital entities and like improved upon them, slow and steadily over time, people started to understand like we were serious. Like we were trying to build something, even if it was our first one or two years. And the people who, uh, were with us for those first two years, they saw us evolve. They're like, well, how are you guys doing it? So like, because we're trying to create a process that we're following. And if it's working, like, that's great. How can we find a ways to make it better? And if it's not, like, how do we eliminate it or just like make it better? Like, whatever the case may be. Um, so it was all about documenting the whole process.
Absolutely. Did I answer your question? Perfect. Cool.